Thank you for joining us today. I'm Phil Portman, the CEO of TechStrip. And today we have Rob Dubin hosting our webinar. Rob is the expert of human happiness. He is an in-demand podcast guest, motivational speaker, and happiness coach. Rob has studied human happiness for over a decade, gaining unique insights on the science behind human happiness during his voyage to more than 100 countries all over the world during which he discovered the secret to living a happy and fulfilling life. Please add your questions to the chat and Rob will be answering them at the end of the webinar. Thank you for joining us today, Rob. Well, thank you so much for having me, Phil. I'm excited to be here. It was in February of 1993 and my parents were desperate to find out if my wife and I were still alive. So they've been glued to the television for several days watching every news report they could and so they saw the sheriff on day three come on television and say there was less than a 10% chance that my wife and I could have survived two nights in a raging blizzard in Colorado. And then they were watching the television again on day four when the sheriff came on and said the conditions were too dangerous and they were likely sending live rescuers after our dead bodies. And then on day five, they heard the sheriff come on and say, that uh, they were listing us as missing, presumed dead, and that they would uh, find our frozen bodies in the spring zone. And uh, my wife and I had headed off on a backcountry ski trip with a number of friends to a cabin deep in the Colorado Rockies. And partway there, the weather changed dramatically. It turned into a whiteout blizzard, it became one of the worst blizzards and storms in Colorado history. It went on to snow 10 feet over the next five days. And it trapped people in their cars on the mountain passes and avalanche closed, closed the ski areas. The water supply for the entire town of Aspen, Colorado was threatened. And when the news media was reporting on this massive unprecedented storm, and then when they heard the story about the lost skiers, the story went viral across the country. So millions of people were like my parents, glued to their televisions to see if we would get out alive. And on that fifth day when they were going to call off the search, we finally made contact with the rescuers. So just when it looked like it was about all over for us, we got out of the mountains and we survived. And we were both quite healthy, but my wife had a severe frostbite on her hands and feet. So they rushed her to the hospital in, in Aspen, Colorado. And shortly after she got there, I arrived at the hospital. And the first phone call I received was from the President of the United States congratulating us on our perseverance and our survival. And the next few days, I was on all the nightly uh, news programs and I was on the morning shows for CBS uh, Morning Show and Good Morning America. And mostly they all asked the same questions of how we had survived, the mechanics of what we did to stay warm and to keep moving and all of that. We had no tents, so uh, it was quite a, a difficult situation. But Katie Couric on the Today Show asked a different question. She asked why we had survived. Why had we survived when so many others perish after just a single night in the wilderness? And I knew, I hadn't thought about it, but I immediately knew that the reason we had survived was because we had optimism and we were resilient. And people often say optimism is, you know, seeing the glass half full, but sometimes the glass isn't half full. Uh, maybe the sheriff was right when he said our odds were only 10% of surviving. So maybe the glass was only 10% full. But even if it was only 10% full, for us, it was never 90% empty. We never considered any other possibility than that we were going to get out of the mountains okay and continue our lives as, as we had before. And we were resilient. And our resilience is what allowed us to lay in the snow all night long with no tent, shivering so violently that I thought I would crack a rib, and then get up the next morning and put on our clothes and get my frozen fingers to work and put my skis on and break trail all day long through the thigh deep snow and do the same thing day after day and night after night for five days. So resilience and optimism got us out of the mountains. And those are two of the byproducts of deciding to live a happy life and living in a state of happiness. And you can think how this might affect your own lives. Um, certainly everybody who's in sales knows how much difference it makes if you approach every sale with an optimistic viewpoint that you're gonna close the sale. 
And one study actually done in your industry, in the insurance industry, found that optimistic and happy salespeople close 37% more sales. So you can imagine what a 30%, 37% bump would do to your own bottom line. And resilience is the kind of thing that is an antidote to burnout. So resilience is what could get you through the uh, open enrollment period where you're working a lot of hours without getting burned out, without losing your optimism so that you can be more productive. So that's how I answered uh, Katie Couric. And I realized that that's what really got us out of the mountains. And the afternoon uh, after I was on the Today Show, I got to the hospital to see Dee. And as I walked past the nurse's station, the nurse said, we have a few cards that arrived for you. And she handed me this gigantic box of cards that had arrived from all over the country from friends and strangers. Uh, we got letters from prison inmates who talked about how our survival story had inspired them. We had uh, 50 cards from a local elementary school. All the kids had hand colored and crayon cards, get well cards and pictures showing us in the mountains and all of that. And so I walked down the, the hall to Dee's hospital room with this box of cards. And uh, as I got to her room, I heard a whole lot of noise. And when I opened the door, I looked inside and I saw 15 or 20 of our friends all surrounding Dee, gathered around her bed. Everybody was joking and laughing and hugging. And the, the joy and love was just overflowing out of the room. And nobody had noticed me yet in the doorway. And I just stood there in the doorway for a minute. And, and I looked in, I saw the bouquets of flowers and fruit baskets that had arrived from all over. And the warm, uh, the evening sun, a winter, low winter sun was just coming in the window and filled the whole room with this warm yellow light. And I just stood there and just absorbed all the joy and love that was being passed around the room. And the lesson that I learned in that moment and that our parents and friends had all learned and that the strangers who had written us letters had learned was how precious life is and how important it is to reach out to the people that are important in your life and, and tell them that you love them. And if, uh, if me retelling the story now reminds each of you to do that, it'll certainly have been worth it. And so I just stood in the doorway there for a moment and enjoyed that scene. And for my parents, what they had been through was like going through a long, long, dark tunnel we, you know, for those five sleepless days and nights that they had spent wondering and worrying about us. And now they were seeing the, the light at the end of the tunnel, perhaps. But sometimes in life, the light at the end of the tunnel is really a freight train barreling full speed at you. And that was the case here. Dee and I were about to find out that our survival experience was really a, a prelude to the real challenge ahead of us. Uh, the days of uh, breaking trail through that five deep snow and those freezing, freezing nights with no protection had really taken a toll on her. And her hands and feet were badly, badly frostbitten. Her, her feet from about the middle of the foot all the way through her toes were coal black and the hard as a rock. And her fingers were the same. They were this ghastly gray monotone color. And they looked like your fingers, you looked like you could snap them off by like breaking a twig. And uh, so that was the real challenge ahead of us. And on the third day that we were in the hospital, the doctors pulled me aside from her hospital room and told me they were gonna to have to amputate both of her feet at the arch of the foot. And that they would wait a few days and then they would do a second surgery and amputate all of her fingers as well. And I think the doctors must have said something else because I remember seeing their mouths move, but I had this roaring in my ears and I couldn't hear anything. And somehow I, I staggered out to my car and I drove home and when I walked in the door of our house, I saw a pair of Dee's running shoes there by the front door where she had taken them off after her last run. And when I saw her little shoes there, my legs just turned to dust and I collapsed on the floor. And I lay there on the floor all night long right by our front door, just crying uncontrollably, hugging myself in a fetal position, trying to imagine what kind of life lay ahead for us. And 
periodically, if I'd stopped crying, I would open my eyes and I was still there on the floor and right in front of me were these shoes that I knew she would never ever wear again. And I would start crying all over again. And I lay like that all night long, just feeling as powerless as I had ever felt in my life. This terrible fate was about to happen to my wife and there was nothing I could do about it. But I woke up somehow completely transformed and felt as powerful as I'd ever felt in my life. And I raced to the hospital and I went into D and I told her she was gonna have a complete recovery. And from that moment onward, that's all that we focused on was having a complete recovery. And what we decided in that moment was to be happy and live the kind of happy lives we had always lived. And we didn't say we were gonna be happy if she recovered or happy when she recovered. We just decided we were still gonna have happy lives no matter what. And later on that morning, uh, later on that afternoon, uh, well, the doctors came in and to prepare D for the surgery and we refused to sign the papers authorizing the amputation surgery. We, we just decided to be in charge of our own lives and, and seek a different uh, re result. And I have to tell you, uh, I come from a medical family. My father's a physician. My uncles and brothers are all in the healthcare medical field. My first jobs were working in a hospital as an orderly. So I have huge respect for the medical community. And I'm not particularly, neither of us are into alternative medicine. We're not particularly spiritual or, or religious, but we do know that our minds can accomplish huge things for us that we maybe don't think are possible. And so that's what we focused on. And we had been mentored for a few years by Tony Robbins. And later that afternoon, Tony called Dee in the hospital and he talked to her about how to think about her recovery and to get help, shared some techni techniques with her on how to visualize her recovery. And he, he sent us some information from his friend uh, Deepak Chopra that she focused on. And he urged both of us to focus on thinking about a compelling life and a compelling future for ourselves. And that's what we did. And then the last thing Tony said was he told us he was doing a new program the next year and it was gonna be a 10 day program combining all the things he knew and taught. And he invited us to come and, and be his guests at the program the next year. So, so we had a, a goal, which was to be at his seminar the next year. And we had a plan, which was to focus on a creating compelling future for ourselves. And we had a strategy for D to, visualize her cells and her, her feet getting better. And she ended up in the hospital for 21 days. Uh, we finally had a sort of a, a truce with the doctors and they agreed not to push for amputations as long as she didn't get gangrene. And so she was in the hospital for 21 days and then she was at home for weeks and weeks, bedridden at home with a nurse coming in, changing her bandages twice a day for weeks. And Day by day, and literally millimeter by millimeter, her feet started to turn pink again. And it was a full year-long recovery, but exactly a year after that day uh, in the hospital and that ski trip, we joined Tony Robbins in Mexico, and Dee went out on that beach in Cancun, and she was dancing in the sand with two feet and ten fingers and nine and a half toes. And so we celebrated that moment in a huge way. And then a year after that, we began to put in place that uh, compelling future that we had planned for ourselves that, that first day in the hospital. And so we sold our home and we bought a sailboat and we set off to sail around the world. And we went on to spend the next 17 years living on our sailboat, sailing around the world. And when there's just two of you on a sailboat, one of you needs to be on watch all the time while the other person is sleeping. So one of you is on watch taking care of the boat. And so you're on watch for six hours a day, day after day, and again, six hours a night each night. And these, these daily watches add up to thousands and thousands of hours of meditation and contemplation. And I started thinking about what we had been through and where we were going and, and thinking about my life so much. And 
there are a few things that can make you feel as insignificant as being on a small sailboat in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You're a thousand miles from any land and you've really surrendered yourself to the wind and the waves, which essentially put yourself at the mercy of the universe. And yet as small and insignificant as you feel, you also feel connected to the entire universe because the oceans connect every part of our world. So one part of our uh, journey, we were leaving from Florida and one of our destinations was Australia, halfway around the planet. But the oceans and, and our sailboat and a little bit of wind in our sails could connect these two places. So I was using all this time I had to think about things and I was thinking about connections and filmmakers and storytellers and authors often refer to what they call the, the through line or the red thread. And the red thread is the idea that ties all the parts of the story together, whether it's a movie or a book. The red thread is the thing that ties everything together. And I came to understand the red thread of my own life. And my red thread is what tied together the three stories I've just told you, the, the story of our ski experience and the story of overcoming the diagnosis, ready, ready to amputate her feet, and now sailing around the world. And all three of those experiences had a successful outcome because of my red thread. And my red thread is that I believe our purpose here is simply to be happy. That's it. I believe our purpose is to make ourselves happy and help others find their own happiness. And I'm not the first person to have this idea. Aristotle said happiness is the meaning and purpose of life, the whole aim and end of human existence. So that's what Aristotle had to say. And he was the wisest philosopher of all time. And more recently, the Dalai Lama said something very similar, that essentially finding happiness is our purpose in life. So that's my red thread. And that's what uh, has led through my whole life and led to the success of what I've accomplished in my life and how I've lived my life. And I spoke earlier about resilience and optimism, and they are the key of byproducts of living a happy life. And so when we were out there uh, skiing and on the fifth day, the same day at 10 in the morning when the sheriff was on television saying that we had a, that they were gonna recover our frozen bodies the next spring. At the same time the sheriff was saying that, my wife and I were discussing how we were gonna make up the lost time we were missing in our office and keep a film editing project we had on, on schedule. So we were discussing this completely mundane detail of our life at the same time that the world is hearing that our frozen bodies will be recovered the next spring. So that's the difference between an optimistic viewpoint and not having one. And as I said, resilience is what allowed us to keep going. And resilience is the antidote to burnout. And whether it's burnout with your work situation, burnout at home, Having optimism and resilience can help overcome those in all parts of your life, your work life and your home life. And so if you, uh, if you gain optimism and resilience, what else do you gain when you gain happiness and joy and gratitude? And for us, these became a huge part of our life. And I can tell you that when we were out skiing, love for my wife was my primary feeling. Uh, every minute we were out there. I won't say we were unhappy. I mean, I won't say we were happy, but we really weren't unhappy. We just knew we were going to have to ski and keep going through a whole lot of pain and discomfort. And gratitude was our other main feeling while we were out there. And you may say, what were you grateful for? You're in this terrible storm in this horrible situation. Well, we were grateful for every little place that the trail went downhill a little bit instead of uphill. We were in this nonstop storm with 40 mile an hour winds and zero degree temperatures for days. But every now and then the wind would let up a little bit and we were grateful for that. At the, at the end of those long freezing shivering nights when we would start to see the sky lighten a little bit and we knew daylight was coming, we were grateful for those moments. So those are the things that are now a complete part of my life. And I spend almost all my waking hours feeling love and joy and gratitude. And so if those are the things you gain when you decide to be happy, well, what do you lose? 
Well, you lose anger and self-recrimination and anxiety and worry. So I have to tell you, if I were to add up all the hours I have felt anxiety or worry in the last year, I don't know, it might be two or three hours, maybe four, certainly not much more than that. I, was, I never, almost never have self-recrimination or go round and round in my head processing something over and over and over again in a deep spiral. For me, what I do is I learn the lesson from my mistakes, and I've certainly made plenty of them, but I learn the lesson, and I leave the pain behind, and I go forward with the lesson. And anger is something most people leave behind when they, uh, when they discover more happiness in their life. I have to admit that for me, that's still a challenge. I, I get angry easier than I would like, and I do it more often than I would like, so that's something I'm still working on. But if you make this decision to be happy and you do some of the things I'm going to share with you in a minute, these are the things that will no longer be a big part of your life. So happiness is really a decision. It starts with making the decision to be happy. Just like if you were going to learn to ski or learn to play a musical instrument, you would make a decision, I want to do this thing, and then you would do certain actions that would lead to that. So happiness is something we decide on. It's not something that happens to us when we check all the right boxes. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you if you're ready to make a decision to be happier in your own life. So I told you my why for being here, that I believe my purpose is to be happy and help others find their own happiness. But now I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I got here. So this is a picture of me uh, making a film. My wife and I had a film production company. We did television shows and TV commercials all over the world. And as I uh, became a little bit interested in sailing long before we took off on our own boat, I pivoted my film production company to where I was making sailing movies. And so we were working a lot with ESPN. We were covering the America's Cup and big, uh, big yacht regattas. And that put us in touch with a unique group of people because the America's Cup cost hundreds of millions to pursue. And so most of the people doing that are multi, multi millionaires or billionaires. <clears throat> and so we would, uh, the millionaires would have their crews deliver the yacht to the regatta, and then they would fly in in the private jet, and then we got to go out sailing with them. So I spent a lot of time with this very wealthy group of people, and I noticed that some of them were happy and some weren't. And then a few years later, we were off sailing, and we were spending our time with barefoot villagers in third world countries, and some of them were happy and some weren't. And the percentages weren't radically different. The billionaires were a little happier, but not hugely. But I was also studying a third group of people, and that was all the other itinerant sailors like ourselves who were just out sailing. And this was the, before the days of the digital nomads. So the people that were out there had really just made a decision to get on a boat because they thought it would make them happy. And we did the same kind of things on a routine basis that created that happiness for us. And so I looked at this entire group of sailors that I spent so much time with, and I realized almost everybody in this group was happy. And I thought, gee, is it really that simple? We've all made this decision to be happy and to do these certain things, and we've all found happiness and we live in happiness every day. And I'd really say it, it is that simple. It's making the decision. It takes a little bit of effort to do the practices to get started, but once you do that, you'll find that you can spend a huge amount of your hours and your days and your years living in happiness. So uh, the, uh, can you go full screen on that? The, the uh, study of, as I studied this group, I also began to study what the scientists, the PhD scientists uh, had learned when they were studying happiness and and, and their universities, they do kind of odd uh, experiments with undergraduates to try and judge their happiness and what changes their happiness for them. And the science of happiness right away identified two different types of happiness. And one of them is called hedonic happiness. It has to do with pleasure and enjoyment. And the other is eudaimonic happiness. It has to do with purpose and meaning in our lives. And if you think about hedonic happiness, that's most of the things that we think will make us happy. So it's, it's things that are going out for a nice dinner, meeting the right partner, getting a good job, buying the new car, having sex, having a good meal. They're all things that make us happy, but they tend to make us happy in the moment 
and it's short lived. You know, you're excited for that new car you buy, but a year from now, it's, it's just your car. And the other kind of happiness, this eudaimonic happiness, is this deep seated happiness that pervades all parts of your life. And it has to do with things that add purpose and meaning to your life. And so that's the kind of happiness that we're really going to focus on. And uh, we also have this mixed notion about happiness because we tend to think that uh, happiness will happen to us when we accomplish certain goals. And that is true that those goals will make us happy. But actually, the reverse is true, that if you decide to be happy, you cue triggers in your brain. You're more creative. You're more productive. As I said earlier, salespeople close more sales. So happy people are more productive, and that leads to more success in their life. So we have that a little bit backwards, thinking we will be happy when X, Y, Z happens. It's really when we be happy, we create X, Y, and Z that then bring more happiness to us. So uh, happiness is a decision and it's a learned skill. When I tell people that I teach happiness, especially if I go into corporations and I, I do full day workshops on happiness training, the HR people get it, but a lot of times the C-suite doesn't get it. And uh, they have a little, you know, some eye rolls and they wanna see numbers and things like that that they make the decisions on. But really happiness is a learned skill. And uh, Harvard University, for instance, started a happiness studies program, and very quickly it became the most popular course in the history of Harvard University. And Yale University followed suit, and they started a happiness studies program, and it became the most popular course in the history of Yale University. So you're going to see more and more of these kinds of happiness trainings, because it is a learned skill. If you make the decision and then you do certain things, you will be happy. And it's a little bit like learning a sport, or maybe if you play a musical instrument, think about the things that you're good at in your life, uh, or maybe your job. In all of those cases, you took some lessons, or you got some instructions, or you read a book, and then you practiced a few things, and then you got proficient at playing the guitar or skiing or whatever it is. So happiness is the same kind of thing. It can be a learned skill. And uh, let me go full screen on that for Oh, so the reason that this is so, so powerful is that the experience of our lives isn't what happens to us. It's how we think about what happens to us. So let me say that again. The experience of our lives isn't what happens to us. It's how we think about what happens to us. And happy people think differently. So we had a third person with us when we were out skiing and trying to get, uh, to get out of the mountains. And after the first night, she was ready to lay down in this. On the second day, she was ready to lay down in the snow and die. She survived one night. She figured there was no possible way she could survive a second night. And my wife and I said, well, we survived one night. We can definitely survive two nights. And then after we had survived two nights, we said we could definitely survive four nights. But this other woman on the second day, we were skiing, she thought there was no point in it, and I was out front breaking trail, and she decided that the day she was done, and she shrugged her pack off her shoulders and just dropped her pack in the snow with her sleeping bag and the rest of her warm clothes and her food and water. And then when we had that, at the end of that day, when we had to dig a pit again in the snow and, and just lay out in the open, I saw she had no pack and no sleeping bag, and my wife ended up giving her sleeping bag to this other woman, and my wife and I tried to use my one bag as a little bit of a cover over us. But the three of us were having the same external physical experience, but the way my wife and I represented it in our mind was completely different. So that's why this is so powerful, is that happy people think so much differently. And the experience of our lives is the emotions and the, how we describe the experience in our own mind. So... I told you in a minute, I was going to ask you if you're ready to, uh, to make the decision to be happier in your own life. And I'd like you to think a little bit about how your life might be different if you added those things I talked about, joy and love and gratitude, and you left behind anxiety and worry. So 
If you're ready to make a decision and to put some of these things into practice, give me a thumbs up in the chat and show me that you are ready to find a happier life for yourself. And I'm going to be quiet for just a moment and let you think about that and how your life could be different going forward. So <clears throat> when my wife and I sold our home, our 2,800 square foot home, and we moved onto a 300 square foot sailboat, we had to get rid of a lot of stuff because the storage space on a sailboat is very limited, very small. We could only take with us things that were gonna help us in our new life, help us sail better or live better, be safer on the boat. We couldn't take anything else. And so we had to get rid of a whole bunch of stuff. Anything that wouldn't help us, we literally just got rid of it, threw it in the ocean. And this is a perfect metaphor for all of us because we're all carrying with us baggage that doesn't serve us. We all have experiences in our past that aren't helping us get to who we want to become in the future. They're holding us back. And so you can do what we did and just get rid of that excess baggage. So I've actually been bald since I was a little kid. And all through my teen years and young adult life, I wore a hairpiece because I thought it made me more approachable in business. I thought it made me look better. But as we sailed away from the dock that very first day, I reached up and I pulled off my hairpiece and I frisbeed it away over the stern of the boat. And I just decided I was going forward as a new person. And so we've all made mistakes and had things in our past that are difficult. Uh, we've all burned our fingers on the stove, for instance. And what do you decide from those, those experiences? Well, if you burned your fingers on the stove, you could decide, you know, I should never eat hot food again in my life. And you're probably chuckling, but in fact, there's probably some place in your life where you made a decision just like that. You, you shut down, you closed off all other possibilities, you quit trying new things because you once burned your fingers. And if you had asked yourself better questions, you might have come up with a different answer. Rather than saying, I'll never eat hot food again, what else could I do? Well, I could use a hot bed. I could let the pot cool before I touch it. So, Asking ourselves better questions is how we invent a new story. And so what I'm suggesting that you do is sometime in the next 48 hours, go for a walk or get some exercise so you're feeling very strong and powerful and your physiology is strong because that helps your emotional state. And then I want you to think about that experience that you're, that story you've been telling that is holding you back. And Think about it in a different way. I want you to think about it like you're in an airliner at 40,000 feet looking down on that experience and it's happening to somebody else. So don't attach any of the pain to it that you felt and that maybe you still feel. Just look down on it very dispassionately and start asking yourself better questions. What else could this have meant? Maybe there was something different you could take from that lesson. Maybe you met somebody or something good happened as a result of it, or at minimum, you learned a lesson of what not to do, but you can still go forward with the lesson without the pain. So if you can try and do this and invent your new story, that will help you gain some rocket fuel to get forward towards your own personal happiness. So when we uh, sailed into the tiny island of uh, Vanuatu, it's a very remote place in the South Pacific, the island of Tana in the country of Vanuatu, this is what we saw, a sailboat much like our own, just totally wrecked on the beach. And it had only happened about a month before, and it had taken with it the dreams and hopes and plans of a couple just like ourselves. And it was a very sobering reminder of our, how we were putting ourselves out there every day sailing, because you know, with your car, when you bring it home and you put it in the garage and you put it in park, probably you're not gonna have a car accident. But on your sailboat, you're just never very far away from a potential accident because the weather can change, conditions can change. So you have to be present and mindful all the time. And what had happened to these people is that the wind had shifted in the middle of the night and now their anchorage that they were in became very dangerous. So they tried to escape out to sea and in the darkness they hit a reef and they, they lost their boat. But it was a very sobering reminder of being present. And because our sailing life required us to be present and mindful all the time and pay attention, 
we were present and mindful for all the happy moments of our lives. And too many of us are so busy chasing the next shiny thing, multitasking, having dinner with our friends with our phone on the table and doing all these other things that we miss the moments that could be happiness for us. And we know multitasking now is the, uh, is the, and it is the worst thing for productivity. When it first came out, the concept first came out, everybody thought, great, I can do three things at once. And then when the productivity experts found out that productivity dr dropped and you were doing none of those things well at once. And so all of the sailors, as I said, we observed the sailing community and almost everybody was happy. And part of the reason we were all so happy is because our lifestyle required us to be present all the time. So if I'm skiing or mountain biking, I'm getting and focused 100% on those things. I'm getting all the joy and juice that life has to offer me at that moment. So the way you can put this in practice in your own life is when you're at the office, give 100% at the office. This idea of quiet quitting is a lose-lose situation. It's a lose for the employer and it's a lose for the employee because for many of us, our job is what gives us our sense of satisfaction and contribution and purpose, the things that eudaimonic happiness. So if you quiet quit, you're hurting yourself as much as you're setting a boundary for your employer. So I urge you when you're at the office, give 100% for the time you're there and be productive and then go home and give 100% to your kid. And when you're doing that, you'll realize what an awesome kid you're raising and what an awesome parent he has. So being present is the way you enjoy those moments that are your happiness. And a happy life is a culmination of hundreds and hundreds of happy moments. But I have to warn you, there's two things you can't do if you're totally present in any moment. You can't be beating yourself up over the past and you can't be agonizing and worrying over the future. So be present. That's a way to enjoy your happiness all the time. And in, for people like yourselves in sales, when you make a sale, take a moment to congratulate yourself. It is that hedonic happiness, but that part of it is important too. So take an extra moment to be present in that moment of happiness and enjoy it fully before you go on to the next sale or the next challenge in front of you. So the simplest thing that I have found and that the social scientists who study happiness have found, the simplest way to happiness is a gratitude practice. And you've maybe heard about it before. People keep gratitude journals. It's a very easy thing to do. But our daily life on the boat was so amazing and so wonderful. You know, most days I would wake up on the boat and, and uh, I'd read a book and maybe about noon I'd put down my book and I'd grab my mask and snorkel and I'd roll over the side of the boat and I'd swim down underneath the boat and I'd grab a lobster and bring it up for lunch. Then in the afternoon we'd go ashore and have some amazing experience like meeting these kids in Fiji and getting to spend time with them in their, in their school and I taught in their school for a few days. And so our life on the boat was so incredible that it forced us every minute of every day to feel grateful. And I can tell you when you spend every minute of every day feeling grateful and you do that for 17 years as we did, for us, there's simply no other way to live. So I am always noticing things in my life that I am grateful for. And having that attitude of gratitude affects everything. Um, I'll tell you a story. Just uh, earlier this week, I was speaking in uh, Wichita. I'm talking to you from Colorado, my home today. But I was giving a speech in Wichita, and I flew home uh, Wednesday morning. And as I was driving from Denver back to the mountain town where I live in, I was just feeling grateful for the opportunity that I had just had to share these ideas with happiness with the group in Wichita. And I pulled off the road for a moment and I ended up getting a flat tire. And my tire was dropping in pressure. I saw the little readout on my dashboard that it was going flat. And so I started looking for a gas station. And when I went into the gas station, I ended up getting in a traffic accident with another truck right next to me. We backed up at the same time and hit each other. So I had a flat tire and then a traffic accident. And the only thing I thought about that whole day before and after was how grateful I was that I got to go to Wichita and talk to people. So this attitude of gratitude can permeate your life to where the ups and down moments of your life 
of our daily lives don't change your overall feeling of happiness. So we had this lifestyle that we were so grateful all the time and we've lived this way for 17 years that now we can't live any other way. And so what you can do for a gratitude practice is very simple. Towards the end of every day, take five minutes and write down five things that you're grateful for. And they can be simple things. You know, your favorite song came on the radio while you were driving home. You got a parking spot near the front door of your office or your kid got an A in school. They can be small things or they can be big things. You closed a big deal, you closed a new sale. But toward the end of every day, write down five things you're grateful for. And here's the key. You have to spend five full minutes thinking about why those things make you grateful. It may only take you a minute to write all five of them, but spend five minutes and use all five of your senses. Because when you embody it with your sense of sight and smell and sound and touch and feeling, it becomes more real to you. So five minutes towards the end of every day, write down five things and start a gratitude practice. And if you're in a group and you work together, sometimes you can share them with your friends. I have a friend who every now and then I'll get a text from her and she'll say, okay, it's time for a gratitude share. And for the next 30 days, we'll text each other our little lists and I'll see something that she wrote. And I went, oh yeah, I'm grateful for that too. So I'll add it to my list. So five minute gratitude practice, it'll change your life. And as we uh, sailed along and we were always grateful for what we had and we were visiting so many people that didn't have what we did that it, it made us want to contribute to others. And even from the very beginning, we had always carried school supplies for the kids we met in these third world countries or, or we carried, uh, I used to carry two extra tools or batteries for the men or fishing, fishing supplies. We always carried uh, sewing supplies that the women always wanted. So we were always donating this kind of stuff to people we met in third world countries. But all of those things were really a band-aid because six months from now, they needed all that stuff again. It made us feel good in the moment, but it didn't change their lives in a big way. But when we sailed into uh, Indonesia, the first port of call we had in Indonesia was this medium-sized city named Kupang. And we were approached on the beach when we first got there by a young woman who offered to be our guide uh, so she could practice her English. And we spent the next few days with her and she was such a charismatic, wonderful, smart, bright young woman. And she told us that her parents only made $200 a month and she hadn't been able to go to college, but she had finally gotten a scholarship and she was going to college. And we were so impressed with her. We knew if she was in the United States, she'd be on a full ride scholarship to Harvard. And we thought, you know, there must be so many other young women like her. I wonder if we can do anything for them. And we talked to our other sailing friends and they all felt the same way that they wanted to make a contribution in some bigger way. So we were only in this city for a week, but my wife and I met with the president of the university there, this teaching university, and he agreed to waive entrance requirements for anybody that we would sponsor. And we met with the headmasters of several of the local high schools and we set up a scholarship criteria based on both academic ability and financial need. And we set up a way for the itinerant sailors like ourselves to make contributions on an ongoing basis to a scholarship program. And so we were gone a week later out of this city, but we left behind something that we, all the sailors in future years would be able to contribute to, even though we're not part of any organization or anything specific, they're just itinerant travelers like ourselves. But that was uh, 13 years ago, and we've now put 29 kids through college five years of college. And that's by far the best thing we did while we were sailing is leaving behind this legacy that of contribution to others. And because we are educating kids, they're going back to their home village and they're sharing it onward. So I think for real eudaimonic happiness, the one thing that I have found that gives and gives and gives to you as well as to others is contribution to something bigger than yourself. And it might be your job and the company you work for. It might be a, a social group you're part of, but find some way to contribute to others in a meaningful way, not just with cash, but with something that makes a difference in people's lives. And if you can do that, you'll find tremendous happiness coming back to you. And I'll tell you that the, uh, that our sailing sort of had, our sailing life had three phases to it. The first phase was what I call the, 
the be happy and don't die phase. And we were totally focused on our own hedonic happiness, our own pleasure. So it was Jimmy Buffett music and beach bars and rum drinks. And the don't die part of it was learning about the sailboat. We were very inwardly focused, learning all the things we needed to do to, to say it, stay alive and not wreck the boat or ourselves. And that was maybe a year or so of our first year. And then we had this kind of mutual benefit phase where, as I described, we carried all those supplies that we gave to people in third world countries and it benefited them, but it also benefited us because they invited us into their lives. We got to see how they lived. We had some incredible experiences. So that was the kind of the mutual benefit phase. But the third phase was this phase where like we started the scholarship where we really focused on contribution and how we could help others. And as I reflected back on it, I realized each time I moved from that first phase to the second phase and the second phase to the third phase, I was moving from that hedonic happiness closer and closer to that eudaimonic happiness that has to do with purpose and meaning in our lives. So I want to uh, just a quick recap. Happiness is a decision we make. You're going to invent your new story. You're going to do a gratitude practice for five minutes each day. You're going to focus on being present and mindful, and you're going to find a way to contribute to others. And I'll tell you that in our sailing life, we have so few distractions that doing these kind of things on a daily basis was really easy for us. And I know that you all have super busy lives, especially this time of year. And so it's hard to find time for these other things. But here's the deal. When you do these things, like the gratitude practice, for instance, what happens is when you get in touch with that feeling of gratitude, your brain releases the happiness chemicals, oxytocin and serotonin and dopamine, and you feel good. And it takes about 30 days for us to develop a habit. But if you do that for 30 days, your brain makes a connection between, I did this gratitude practice, I wrote my things down, I feel good. And then on the 31st day, you don't have to think about doing the gratitude practice and maybe force yourself to do it because your brain says, that feels good, I want to do it. So all of these things, if you can try and do them for a month or so, it'll probably become a habit for you and then they'll become much easier to do, you'll become better at it. And then it's a snowball, it just builds on your happiness. And in closing, I'd like to just share one last idea with you. And I, I think it's kind of a memory that we might all share. And so I'd like all of you to, to close your eyes for a minute and see if you have the same memory that I do. And if you don't have this memory, I bet you can probably imagine it in your mind. So go ahead and close your eyes for just a moment. And my memory is when I was about eight or nine years old and I woke up on that very first day of summer vacation and I had the whole summer ahead of me. And I had a million dreams and plans for the summer. And with that childlike innocence that we all had at that age, I knew every one of my dreams and plans and things I wanted to do were possible. And I knew every day was going to be fun and magical. And we lived in the suburbs. So when I woke up in the morning, I could always immediately smell the, the fresh cut lawn from one of our neighbors or our home. And I could hear the sound of the birds outside my window in the summertime. And <clears throat> then when I first opened my eyes, I, I could see that bright, bright summer sun creeping in around the edge of the curtains in my bedroom. And so if you have that memory or if you've created that image in your mind, hold that image for just a moment. And now I want you to open your eyes. And I'll tell you my secret. My secret is that I woke up that way this morning. And I wake up that way every single morning. And you can do the same thing. You can wake up every morning knowing that the day is going to be fun and magical. And your goal is to be happy for yourself and help others find their own happiness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. And we have uh, a few questions uh, from the chat. Um, let's start with, uh, hello, do you believe in mental health? And if so, how do you find happiness with major medical health issues, such as major depression, bipolar, panic disorder, et cetera, or at least live with it and still find happiness? So I have to tell you that I'm not competent or qualified to really answer that question. 
because if you need mental health expertise, you need that expertise. And I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist. So I try and stay in my lane. And when I teach that uh, invent your new story process, I often tell people, this is for the kind of minor trauma that we all have in our lives. If you have serious mental health issues, you need mental health expertise. Um, I will tell you, when I go into corporations and I do my happiness training, a lot of times somebody will say, well, we have a mental wellness program. But there's a gigantic difference because if you think of happiness on a scale of one to 10, most mental wellness corp programs in corporations are aimed at the people that are one and two. They're already depressed and burned out. And the goal is to make them a three or a four so they can be productive and, and keep working and continue their lives. But the goal of happiness training is to get everybody up to a nine or a 10. So you're having a, a peak work experience and a peak life experience. And if you do this in a corporate setting, the corporation is more profitable because engagement is so high and the employees are happier and they produce more. So I hope that's a bit of an answer to your question. Uh, next question is, uh, thank you for your amazing life experiences, which have shaped your happiness. Can you recommend any happiness programs like Harvard and Yale, which you mentioned, for school? This sounds the route to training young people to be grounded and have control over their mental health. Absolutely. Well, I do corporate, I do corporate uh, happiness programs, but I don't have an individual one myself yet, although I'm working on it. But Harvard does have a happiness studies program that is an online program. And I believe Yale has one that part of it is free. So definitely check those out online. And there, there are many others as well. And then I have a question. I, I'd, I'd like to ask how much environment uh, plays on, on happiness. Um, you seem to be somebody that, that has a, a really supportive partner um, you know, with you. You guys talked about how you, how you kind of bounced off of each other and I've been in an environment uh, in, in the past, a, a business that I had with, with somebody who was projecting a lot of their issues and struggles on me. And it, it almost made me question myself at times, like, am I really this person? You know, um, How much does that environment kind of play on somebody's happiness? Well, like uh, you brought up a couple of different things there. First of all, I'll do a quick brag. My wife and I just celebrated our 40th anniversary a couple of weeks ago. So you're right. I have an incredibly supportive environment. We worked together for all of our career and then we lived on the boat together. So that's a big part of it. So it, the science part of happiness, one of the things that the PhD scientists that study this field of positive psychology have found is that relationships are one of the key, key factors towards that eudaimonic happiness. So it's really important for people to, to uh, cultivate, excuse me, cultivate those good relationships. And we have this epidemic of loneliness today and there's some new books out about that and people really need to find some kind of supportive environment. So that is a big part of it. Uh, the relationship side of what you mentioned is certainly critical to happiness. On the other side of it, the scientists have found that this, the uh, circumstances of our life, which would be our financial situation, our work life, um, and our health only really account for 10% of our happiness, our quotient for happiness. So that's quite an incredible because if you ask people what would make them happy, it's usually things about their finances or about their work or that kind of stuff. But the scientists say, you know, and we know that people that uh, have terrible accidents and end up in a wheelchair for life, they actually recover back to where they were on a happiness level very, very quickly or the same with people who go through amputations. And I'm glad we didn't do that, but we know those people recover. The one thing that is really hard to overcome, according to the science side, is chronic pain is really difficult to, to break through. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, does anybody else have any additional questions uh, they wanna post in the chat before we close out here? And if not, uh, Rob, uh, thank you for today. Can you uh, kind of tell us where, if someone wants to follow up with you, uh, where they can get in touch with you and what you got going on? Sure. There's a QR code here on the screen that leads you to my website. But my website is just my name, Rob, R-O-B-D-U-B-I-N, robdubin.com. And there's some resources on there that people can uh, go to the resource page. There's some things to download about uh, how we afforded to retire early, how we 
worked on relationship, living together in small spaces. And then there's the framework for happiness that I teach is on there. So there's some resources people can find there and uh, reach out. And I'm, I'm happy to respond to anybody who sends an email or a question. Thank you so much, Rob, for, for everything today. Uh, this is incredibly inspiring and I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. It's been a joy. And thank you everyone for joining and I look forward to seeing you all next uh, month's webinar. Have a good one.